Most designers are making a huge mistake by ignoring Canva. After 20 years in design and running a six-figure design agency, there's one thing I've learned that separates successful designers from those who struggle. It's how they approach tools like Canva. Most designers hate it. But what if that mindset is exactly what's limiting your potential? When I started using no-code tools like Squarespace and WordPress, everyone around me was scoffing at them. They said the code was messy, the design too rigid, but I didn't listen. I knew something they didn't, and it ended up being one of the best decisions I made for my career. And this behavior led me to run my six-figure design agency. In this video, I'm going to show you why, after two decades in the design industry, I believe Canva is an essential tool for any designer who wants to stay ahead. The reasons might surprise you. So what is it about Canva that can make or break your design career? To answer this question, I need your attention because it's pretty complex. First, we need to understand, why do you hate Canva? Well, obviously, it's not about jealousy or fear of losing your job. It's something else. It's about the passion we have for our thoughtful and meaningful design profession. Designers pride themselves on creating work that's not just visually appealing, but deeply considered, where every choice reflects the what, the why, the purpose, and the audience. That's why so many of us um, cringe when we see clients take a tool like Canva and throw together a template with some text slapped on top. That's not design. And when it happens, it feels like it hurts everyone. Clients who get something less meaningful, beginner designers who struggle to find work, and the profession itself, which can feel undervalued. But here's the thing, it sounds logical to feel this way. It feels like a real threat to design as a craft. But in reality, it's completely different from what's actually happening. And we can't see this because we are all in our own informational bubbles. To truly understand what's wrong with this mindset, we need to step outside our subjective view and look at this more objectively. We need to zoom out. One of the best ways to do that is to look at similar patterns in other industries where change and disruption have caused similar fears, particularly in one of the most well-researched fields, medicine. What if I told you the same fears designers feel about Canva once existed in the medical field? And it turned out those fears were completely misguided. Let's take a look at how this comparison can help us see the design profession and tools like Canva through a different lens. Take doctors, one of the highest paid professions in several countries. In two similar cultures, the US and the UK, doctors' earnings are drastically different. In the US, doctors make a lot of money. In the UK, they earn, well, not badly, but not as much either. It makes you wonder why the difference. What do doctors have to do with design, you might ask? The point is that the medical profession has developed into a very socially interesting institution shaped by unique circumstances. There are strong protective mechanisms in place. The barriers to entry are high, and once you're in, the competition isn't just about providing better care. It's also about protecting yourself from competitors. It's about making sure the market remains exclusive, so it's difficult for outsiders to break in. These protective systems aren't just about skill, they're about controlling who gets access and how the profession is perceived. Sound familiar? In design, we see similar mechanisms at play. Think about how we elevate traditional design tools and processes, tools that require years of experience, and how we sometimes scoff at no-code tools like Canva. It's a way of protecting our craft, ensuring that only real designers can access certain types of work. But is that really necessary? Now, here's where it gets interesting. Historically, those who uh, broke these barriers sometimes proved to be more capable than the ones who went through the traditional system. Take field surgeons from World War I and II, these were people with little formal education who gained experience by working with wounded soldiers on the battlefield. After the war, their skills often surpassed those of doctors who had spent eight years in formal education. In other words, hands-on experience and adapting to the situation in front of them made them more effective than those following a rigid path. This is exactly what we're seeing with Canva and design today. It's natural for any profession to want to elitify itself, to take what we do and raise it up, making it something exclusive, something only those with the right credentials, the right experience, the right tools can access. I've been a designer for a long time. I make websites. And in our world, we take our work very seriously. Uh, we're professionals, after all. 
We tell clients that to do this right, you need a big team, a lot of experience and years of education. Especially when you're working with large businesses, it's perfectly normal to say these things. It's not just about doing good work. It's also about showing that you're serious and successful. For the business, it's a sign that you're worth investing in. That's why when a designer gets commissioned to create a brand book, it's normal to spend six months on research, studying the audience, crafting a massive document about market insights and packaging it all into a big impressive book. This is all part of how we elevate our profession. But here's where it gets interesting. Is all of that research always necessary? Or are we sometimes inflating the perceived value of what we do? Uh, creating layers of exclusivity that make the process feel more significant than it really is. I'm not saying that this uh, work is meaningless. It certainly has its place, but often it's not as essential as we make it out to be. There's this sense that the more time, the more effort, the more layers of process we add, the better the final product will be. And that's not always true. In fact, it reminds me of something I've seen play out over and over again. The Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule. You can achieve 80% of the result with 20% of the effort. That last 20% of perfection often requires 80% of the effort, resources, and time. But is it really worth it? Does it always lead to a better outcome? Maybe, but uh, more often than not, it's just about inflating the perceived value of the work. And I've seen this firsthand. In my years running a design agency, working with major clients, I've realized that all the research, all the effort we pour into these long projects often doesn't change the final result as much as we think. A brand identity designed by a senior level designer can be completed in a week, sometimes even in two to three days. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean it's cheap, absolutely not. There's a famous saying, it took me 10 minutes to create this picture, but it cost a thousand dollars. Because before that, I spent 10 years learning how to make this picture in 10 minutes. The point is, our profession has built these protective mechanisms, these layers of exclusivity to show that what we do is important and worth investing in. But at what point does it stop being about the quality of the work and start being about preserving the idea that design should be difficult, exclusive, and only accessible to those who pay for all those extra layers? Of course, you understand what I'm getting at here. It's about how tools like Canva allow you to do things faster, to simplify certain uh, tasks, and that's undeniably useful. But maybe this idea doesn't fully land for everyone because comparing designers to doctors and their protective systems might feel a bit distant. I get it, the professions aren't the same and their protective mechanisms are very different. In Canva, everything's laid out for you, ready-made templates, easy to use features. It can feel like you're just slapping something together. But if you're a designer, chances are your preferences align with most others. You might not like Canva. It feels like a tool for amateurs, but let's be honest, you probably do like Webflow or Framer. And here's the irony. Webflow, which is loved by so many designers, is viewed by developers the same way designers view Canva. I've seen this time and time again. Around 15 to 18 years ago, when I was just starting out, the design studio I worked at used to mock WordPress templates. They were the first no-code systems to really make an impact. Back then, developers and designers alike couldn't stand them. They were too rigid, too simple. The argument was the same. This isn't real design or this isn't real development. Sounds like you're not a real doctor. Developers, much like uh, designers feel about Canva, don't like Webflow. They say the code isn't clean. Uh, they argue that it lacks flexibility. But here's the thing, just as Webflow is a magical tool for us, designers, allowing us to create without needing developers, Canva does the same for those who don't have a formal design background. It's the same fear just in different professions. Developers feel threatened by Webflow, just as designers feel threatened by Canva. Both tools break down the traditional barriers that we've spent years building. They simplify processes that we've made complex. And just like developers look down on Webflow, designers dismiss Canva as nothing more than a template machine. But is that really true? Or are we just holding on to our own protective systems, fearing that opening up the design world might diminish our value? The truth is, just like Webflow, Canva isn't going away. In fact, more and more designers, myself included, are finding ways to use it to our advantage. It's not a replacement for deep design thinking, but a tool that can make certain processes faster, more efficient, and just as impactful. That's why I'm deeply convinced that Canva is an excellent tool that should never be ignored. Just like Gen AI tools such as Midjourney, 
or Adobe Firefly, it's a game changer that can't be overlooked. When you look at how many people are actively using Canva and how industry giants are even copying it, like with Adobe Express and similar applications, it becomes clear that this isn't a passing trend. Canva is here to stay. Now, when I first tried using it myself, I won't lie, it felt limiting. Like any professional designer, the templated nature bothered me. The interface has its constraints and it doesn't allow for the same level of creativity you might get with traditional tools like Illustrator or Figma. But here's the thing, if I upload my own templates, branding assets or visual elements, Canva and Adobe Express make it far easier for me to create things quickly, especially for tasks like presentations or repetitive, uh, repetitive design needs. And the argument that this isn't real design because it's just uh, templates lacking consideration for the audience objectives or deeper design thinking, well, that feeling hasn't entirely changed. But I've come to realize uh, something important. Those templates aren't competing uh, with what we do as designers. Now, they're just adding visual aesthetics to things that uh, before Canva would have been done without design at all. In that sense, we are not in competition with Canva. On the contrary, Canva is a tool for democratizing design and I see it as a kind of springboard. It gives clients a taste of what's possible, but they'll eventually realize when they need uh, real design expertise. And that's where we come in. Has the barrier to entry in design interfaces risen with tools like Canva, Adobe Express, and AI tools like Midjourney? Absolutely. It's true that now, even for minimal design work, a designer has to be at the level far above what someone can do on their own. In a way, these tools have actually raised the bar. But overall, I see this uh, as a good thing. Clients now have a great way to get quality visuals quickly and affordably. They're happy and it works efficiently for many of their needs. But here's the beauty of it. This often leads them faster to full-fledged design work, which uh, they'll seek out from professionals like us. And who knows, depending on the task, we might even use Canva to deliver that work. But if you feel that you shouldn't trust professional designers to use tools like Canva because it's too simple, and that simplicity poses a threat to quality, I'd like to invite you to consider this. What if the very thing that makes Canva too simple is actually what allows professionals to focus on what really matters? Solving problems, thinking strategically, and delivering quality results faster? The ability to get cheap visuals, quick, easy ways to make something look professional has been around for a long time. And I remember clearly when websites, especially in fields like legal services, all started adding gavels to their headers, even when they had nothing to do with courts. Why? Because stock photo websites had emerged, allowing people to buy images instead of commissioning expensive photography. Before that, you had to buy CDs filled with clip art or hire a professional photographer. Then, as free stock photo platforms like Unsplash emerged, everything became even cheaper. Soon after, they even started offering free videos. The web was flooded with visuals that anyone could use. And while it's true that tools like Canva and Midjourney have introduced a new wave of visuals, the truth is the market was already saturated with free and inexpensive visuals long before they came on the scene. But here's the real challenge. It's not that these tools are inherently bad or that they ruin uh, design. The danger, especially for beginners, is falling into what I call the visual trap. And trust me, I know this trap all too well because I spent several years of my early career stuck in it. Back then, the design world was nothing like it is today. There were no YouTube tutorials or endless resources on Twitter or design blogs. I didn't have access to foundational design knowledge. Instead, I was just replicating what I thought looked good, what was trendy on platforms like DeviantArt. This was before Dribbble came along. And many times, those trends had nothing to do with the actual needs of uh, the projects I was working on. I was focused entirely on the aesthetics. Thinking design was all about making things look good good, but I didn't understand the fundamentals, the why behind design choices or how to solve real-world problems for, for clients, I lost valuable years simply because I didn't know what I didn't know. And this is where tools like Canva and Midjourney can sometimes hurt beginners. For those who haven't yet grasped the foundations of design, these tools might encourage a focus on visuals over substance. It's easy to create something that looks decent quickly, but without the knowledge of design principles, it's just decoration. But here's the thing. This is only a trap if you ignore the fundamentals. Today, we live in a world where design knowledge is more accessible than ever before. There are books, 
courses, YouTube channels, and entire communities dedicated to teaching design. The barrier to learning the right way has been lowered significantly. So yes, tools like uh, Canva might make it easy to fall into the trap of focusing only on visuals, but I don't place the blame on Canva or any other tool for that. The responsibility lies with the designer. If you're avoiding these tools or worse, looking down on them because you think they're beneath your profession, then it's not the tool that's the problem, it's inertia. You're holding on to the idea that design should be difficult, exclusive and reserved for those who go through the tradition traditional path but I think that's where we have to question our own motivations. For doctors, protecting the profession made sense financially and ethically in the past. But for us designers, is it about quality or is it about protecting the idea of what design should be? In our case, these old protective patterns won't work because the world is evolving differently. We no longer have a monopoly on the tools and processes that define design. We don't have the luxury of building real impenetrable walls around our profession. And the more you resist this change, the higher the chance that you'll face a crisis. One day you'll realize it's too late to start learning. You'll already be behind in your skills, your understanding of the world and the modern way of doing things. That's why my call to all designers without exception, regardless of your level, is to try doing your next project in Canva. Take a real task, whether it's sketching a website layout, creating a presentation or designing an image for social media and solve it using Canva. Sure, something like designing a logo might present some challenges, but I encourage you to step out of your comfort zone and give it a try. It might feel uncomfortable at first because it's not what you're used to, but that discomfort is where growth happens. Learn the tool, explore its potential, and see how it can streamline your work. It may surprise you just how beneficial it can be. But in truth, mastering the tool itself, that's not the real benefit. At least it's not the most important thing you'll gain. The true value comes from stepping out of your comfort zone, breaking through your own inertia and actively shaping your future. Because it's decisions like this, small choices like embracing a new tool that determine where your ceiling will be in the world of design. Will you become a world-class expert or after 30 years in the field, will you find yourself as the grumbling designer stuck in the past?